Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of More Perfect Marketing. My name is David Baer. Today, I'm chatting with Marcio Santos, who's joining me from Toronto, Canada. Now, Marcio has a, an interesting background, uh, both working in the marketing agency space and then starting up his own agency, working with some really interesting types of clients uh, across the board. And we'll talk about some of the sort of larger types of clients, smaller types of clients. But when the pandemic hit, you actually decided to focus very, very narrowly. And this is something that I, I think a lot of my clients will uh, resonate with because they hear me talk about it all the time. Getting narrower is actually a, an effective uh, way to get more exposure and be uh, more efficient at building your business. So I'm eager to hear that story. Marcio, welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, I, it is a great pleasure to have you here. We were just chatting before we even uh, started a recording. And um, what, one of the things that I hope you'll you'll share with us, and, and probably now because I'm about to set you up to do it, is, is to uh, give us a little bit of intro into the, the journey that you had from uh, when you first got into the marketing world to, to where you are now. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, it definitely, uh, it's been a long journey. Uh, I started really marketing as a graphic and web designer way back when lurking at a small little studio, slicing images and JPEGs and GIFs and things like that. And from there, I went into uh, uh, course kind of course design, but it was more like Flash, like when Flash was a thing. So I'd create animations and quizzes and things like that and put those into an LMS system. And eventually I, I, I graduated and went into, you know, the marketing, uh, the agency world, work with incredible brands and, you know, uh, uh, recently, I started really focusing on the digital side. So I'd say over the last, you know, 10 years, 10, five, five, six years, getting really specific on SEO, web analytics, email marketing, content marketing, stuff like that. And so that's really what I've been sharing and applying to the course creator world now is all these skills that I've been focusing on in the past five or six years uh, on the digital side. And and so we should say that um, when I said you you've sort of narrowed your focus, that the focus that you have these days um, at your company, which is called Nerd Digital, is on course creators, and that's that's a uh, a space that I think um, many people who have not been exposed to it in the past, probably over the course of twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, at least started hearing a lot more about creating your own courses and all of this stuff that. You know, probably um, as we're seeing with this pattern of what what we're hearing, the great resignation where lots of people are, are leaving, you know, employment or business owners trying to figure out new ways to get exposure, that courses is uh, is often one of those things that's in the mix. Right. So courses really is definitely an expansion. As you've mentioned, through COVID, a lot of people have found success creating a course, launching a course, even spinning it up very quickly. Even courses that are applied for people that now have an, a certain need because of the pandemic. So how do you homeschool your children? Or how do you cut your own hair? Or you know, how do you do things at home that you can no longer do in person? How do you set up a virtual summit or something like that? Uh, and so really, when you, when you back out and you look at what is the course, the course is simply a delivery method. It's a way that you provide value to your customer. So if you're a local service provider, for example, you could, uh, and you, you can no longer service people locally in your shop, you could develop a course to deliver the same value. Uh, so you have a unique uh, audience, you have a unique a solution. The delivery method is simply the course by, by which you, you give that value to your customer. I saw a lot of this happening uh, probably very early on in the pandemic when, you know, restaurants were like one of the, the ones that uh, those categories that absolutely had to shut down. And how does a restaurant survive? Well, some of them figured out ways to still feed people um, remotely. But I saw lots of stories about, you know, chefs who were teaching classes online or even creating products like what you've just described, where they're teaching the people uh, who used to be there, you know, in restaurant patrons, how to cook the things that they cook and giving away, you know, what might be their secrets. And I, I, I would imagine that a lot of people uh, initially 
probably said, well, I don't, I don't want to give away my secrets, but in fact, you know, the business that they, they have, the, the restaurant, the four walls is a very different experience than what somebody's going to be able to do rep, attempting to replicate that, that dish at home. What, what sort of experiences have you um, witnessed or, or, or worked on um, along those lines in, in terms of transition from real world to, to, to an online course version of it? Hmm. So I don't have any clients that, you know, have that type of course, but I, I have bought a course just recently from a physical trainer, a personal trainer. His uh, course is, you can go to his YouTube channel, it's called the Knees Over Toes Guy. And he, he's, his program is at atgonline.com, I think that's where it is. And, and the reason why I bought it is because I want to get back into playing soccer. And I used to play a lot of soccer, my knees and my ankles and stuff, they just don't work as well. And by watching his videos, he's able to dunk now, and he, he used to have knee problems. And what's really interesting about him is that usually he would only service people at his gym. And what I thought was so fascinating was how he was able to take his program, unpack it, and create one small little course. It's like a $49 a month program. And you go in, you buy this program, and there's eight or nine exercises, super easy to follow. But the the nuance this tweak that he did was he gives you coaching but it's very tiny coaching it's send me the last three reps of your last set so he's not asking to send you like for you to send him a 30 minute video a 10 minute even a one minute it's like 15 seconds and so when you look at it from the course creator perspective it's something that's very scalable and still very very valuable for the consumer because when he saw my videos or when somebody on his team saw my videos and sent me feedbacks, like, hey, Marcel, your, your posture is not right. You're, you're putting your whole back on the wall. You're only split, supposed to put your glutes on the wall. I was like, wow, this is, he, he definitely watched my video. It was only five seconds long, but still, it, it was, there was a lot of value exchange there. Something that is, is it's hard to replicate at scale, but I think he's, he's doing a really great job at it. It's fascinating because I, I think of a course as a one-sided sort of, you know, you're there consuming stuff that is, is pre-recorded and that there is no interactivity, B- specifically because of the scalable, uh, you know, challenge, but you, you've you identified something that can make it scalable because it's ultimately not a ton of work on, on their end to, to, you know, review something quickly. Uh, and so finding a way to apply that to whatever business, you know, somebody might be in where they can help people and then... I'm assuming that, you know, from the course, some people might graduate to a different type of relationship with the course creator, uh, uh, you know, being a direct client of theirs or, or a consulting client or whatever that business happens to, to provide. Yeah, definitely. So I work with another client. His name is Robbie Crabtree, and he has something similar to that, where he has an entry, kind of like an entry level program called performative speaking. And so through that founders and, uh, founders of startups, they can learn to be better speakers, uh, but you can also graduate from that into, you know, a more uh, direct relationship with, with him, which is called the, the founder's story. And in that program, you work one-on-one with him and he more hands-on. And so there's a different price point, there's different kind of access to him and different support level of support and coaching that you get from him and his team. So definitely like, they're like an entry-level program. And then there's a more high experience, high touch type of experience after that. All right, we, we've been talking a lot about courses and content and structure, but I want to get into the the meat and potatoes of the stuff that you're an expert in, which is how uh, courses find their customers, right, their students, and how that connection gets made, and ultimately how the sales of those courses get made. So, I, I you know, I, I can guess a lot of this. I have not worked a lot in the um, selling of courses space, only the creation of courses space. So. What are the sort of the, the, the foundational principles that you need to start with when it comes to selling a course? Yeah, so there are three steps that we use in our program, three phases. There's the product phase, there's a funnel phase, and then there's the audience phase. So, Johnny. So on the, on the product phase, oh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. So on the product phase, what we really do is we get clear on the avatar and the transformation and the messaging, right? So, oof, I'm distracted right now. 
That's okay. Do you, if so, if you want, if you if you want, we can. Uh, I'll I'll make a note to edit here. So that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he has Spider Man colors on today. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, no no, no worries. I'm, I'm, I'm a parent too. I understand. <laughs> okay. So in our program, we have these three phases, right? So we help you with the product. That's phase one, your funnel, and then your audience. And the, the mo when you, you said fundamental, phase one is the most fundamental. And it's often the phase that most course creators skip. And what we do in phase one is we get super clear on your avatar. Who is this person that you're serving? We want to really understand this, this person. And the second part we want to understand is what is that key transformation that you're offering to them? And that really stems from what is the, the pain points that they're feeling? And we combine both of those things, um, two, th two things together to wrap up phase one with the messaging. So we combine all these things into a course name, a course offer, that is compelling so that, you know, when people land on your sales page or when they even read your, your lead magnets and they, they're going to turn into uh, a lead to, to get into your funnel, you're doing a great job of attracting people, of converting people, getting them into your funnel, getting them excited for your course that will eventually launch. So uh, those are, are really the, the building blocks for a successful course. Okay. I, I, a question here, because you, you brought up something that, um, is often a challenge for most product creators, course creators, service creators in general, which is um, you, you've gotten clarity around the avatar. What uh, tells the course creator that that course is even wanted by the market? Like, exactly. Is there, is there a, any validation that they have to go through? It, that, that's a very important question. And usually there's two steps to two approaches to this. One approach that I know is simply, have you worked with this type of avatar before? Right. So if you've coached this type of person, if you've worked directly with this type of person, like the gym uh, example that we spoke about or the service provider example, if you've worked with this person before, what you want to do is stop and ask yourself out of the universe of people that I've worked with thus far, which type of person have I helped the most get the, the biggest type of uh, transformation? What was the most valuable to that type of person? And you want to unpack that. You want to really understand, it's like, okay, really, what that person come to me for? Was it to build a website? Was it to build a course? Was it to build, get an audience? What is it to fix my back pain? What was the issue? That's one approach, right? So just focus on the people that you've already helped and create your course from that. The other approach is to go to market. And so you could do this by creating a survey and trying to survey people. Right. That's that's one common approach. Another another way to do this is to read into existing products or existing solutions and find gaps in what exists. Hmm. Right. So. So, for example, uh, one play that you might use is simply go to Amazon, go to books on, on a specific type of category. So I see small business email marketing on your shelf there. Mm -hmm. And you're, you, if you have a product or a course on email marketing, I could go to Amazon.com and I could read up on the small business email marketing books that are there. And I could look at the reviews. I could see what people are saying and what people are not saying and what people are saying poorly about those books. Because usually what that means is, well, one, people have spent money to buy the books, meaning there's a market, there is interest, that there's validation already that people will give money. And two, what you're also seeing is that there, there's, there are gaps that you could fill. Yeah. Right. So that's one simple, straightforward play that you could use to validate whether or not um, what you're going to create has an audience for it. Beautiful. Um, and and, and I, I love the example that, you, you know, we marketers talk about that Amazon example a lot, but I imagine, I don't, I, don't, I don't recall that it's ever come up here on the podcast, but I imagine every time I share that with somebody, it's like, you know, it's, it's the first time they're hearing it. And it's like, oh, that's amazing. And that, that is really, you know, gold for people who are intimidated by the, how do I do research? How do I figure this stuff out? Well, you can do it, it what, what I call sort of voyeuristic research, right? <laughs> where, where you don't have to go and survey people, but you can just go and do a little bit of research online or la maybe it's lazy market surveying is what it is. Um, but ultimately you're getting some great, 
great ideas and and information out of something like that and, that, and that's that's really really useful okay so you you now have uh the the product itself what are the the considerations about kind of logistics where does that course live and where do you market the course how do you what do you charge for the course? all of those sort of next step things that people are are wondering before you can obviously start selling it yeah so i think one step before that is you want to think about the course format so essentially there are two types of formats one you already mentioned which is the course that you create you put on a shelf and people come and consume it on their own at their own time let's call this an evergreen course. Mm -hmm. The other type of course is what we call a cohort-based course. And a cohort-based course is what it sounds like where you join a group of people at a specific time and you go through different modules of the course together with a, another group of people. And I think that's an important question for you to ask yourself is, well, which type do I want? Which type do I want to create? And these, the answer to that will answer the question, your subsequent questions. So one interesting bit of data that I that I read about is that when people buy the evergreen courses, only about 10 to 15% of people that buy those courses actually finish them. Yeah, I've, Whereas I've, I've heard people, those numbers a lot. Yes. When people buy a, a cohort based course, 80% plus of people finish those courses. What's also true is the cohort based course, it can it also mimics a little bit of like a coaching program. And coaching programs, because there's live interaction, because there's feedback, and because you can coach people through their specific needs, there's an opportunity for you to charge more. And so where you would have been able to charge, I don't know, maybe $100 for your course if it's an evergreen, you could charge $1,000 for your course if it's a cohort-based model. Mm -hmm. right? And so uh, the cohort-based course, that's, that's what I've been working on with my customers, with my clients, uh, to create. Uh, cohort-based courses to market the, the cohort-based courses and to charge um, higher tickets for for their course, and, and that makes a, a lot of sense, just sort of logistically and financially, right? You don't have to get as many people in to to make the same amount of money, right? So um, there, there's there's a lot more um, uh, or a lot less effort to make the sale ultimately. But what what's even more interesting was that the those statistics that you shared earlier. Because what happens when you have that 80% success rate um, in, in terms of that student's opinion of you or desire to spend more with you, right? Find out what else, what else they can get from you, right? That, that, that probably is a much smarter approach. It's, it's a much, I mean, I think it depends. I, I've seen both models work. I think it, it really depends on the context as well of what you're trying to teach. Um, what the price point is and how big the transformation is. But if, if all things are, are equal, the, the cohort-based model is very, very interesting. And what you said too about the transformation, that should be the goal. That should be the, the metric that you really measure your performance by, the, your performance of your business by. Mm -hmm. If you create a, a course and people don't get the transformation, well, you didn't really achieve your goal, right? Your goal should be help people and make money. Not just make money and, you know, only 10 to 15 percent of your your audience get a, a transformation. That's really the recipe for success is creating transformation in people. One quote that I heard is a, a, the job of a business is to create happy customers. And the best way to do that is to make sure that they're getting the transformation, that they're coming in with the problem and leaving on the other end with a, in a transformed state, in a better state. And once they're in that better state, they're now primed to get something else, right? So the, after you've helped them with their email marketing, they can say, David, I got this down. Now, what do I do about my systems? What do I do about you know this? How do I over deliver on that? They can come back to David and, and ask for more help. Right, right, beautiful. I, I, I love the, uh, the the job of the business to create happy customers. And and, and I think your, your point is well taken uh, about, you know, there's some scenarios where the evergreen type course does make sense. I'm um, envisioning sort of simple tactical things where it's really, you know, I can go and watch a whole bunch of YouTube videos and try to figure out how to do something and, and you know, uh, paste it all together in my head and, and see con contrasting, you know, ideas presented to me. Or I can invest in a course that'll just show me, you know, A to Z how to do it. Would that be a, a, a good example of where Evergreen is, is maybe a better option? 
I think so. I think one one another way to look at this is to look at the transformation as evergreen being you can teach more tactical, more event based type of transformations, whereas with the course and with the coaching, you're really teaching systems. Um, systems will usually give you a net higher value mm -hmm. because you're not just trying to do, you know, ch follow this path and tick these boxes. It's follow this framework, build your own path or build an existing path, update your path, get coaching to see which things you can skip, which things you can add so that you can then, you know, beat your competitors. Uh, I mean, it's just the, every market you're in just moves so quickly. Things just change so quickly that by the time you publish an evergreen course and somebody takes it, you know, a certain percentage percentage of it is going to be obsolete simply because either if it's a Facebook course, the, the platform has changed, the policy has changed, the formats have changed. Like you always need customized support to your situation at your speed, you know, on your budget. I mean, there's so many nuances to, to each customer. You, you've just reminded me that some uh, courses that I have still sitting on Udemy that I made back in like 2011 about how to advertise on Facebook probably should get taken down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, those are, those uh, yeah, definitely something to to put on your on your to do list. Yes, indeed. Okay, so let, let's let's move forward in the process then, um, because you said that uh, this this decision is key to figuring out kind of the answers to all those other um, points that I made about where and how and and so so what what are the things that sort of are informing those logistical choices? So the logistics are pretty straightforward. We use a platform called System.io. That's S-Y-S-T-E-M-E dot I-O. And we use that to build funnels. Uh, and we also use that with our customers. They can build their funnels on there to convert leads. They can also host their courses there. So even if it's, it is a live course, you can create your course. Uh, you can do it on Zoom, for example, and then you can deliver the replays on that platform. You can also use their platform to send emails. So it's, it has like an all-in-one solution. But other platforms out there like Podia or Thinkific or Teachable, I've used all of those. Those are all fine. They all work. Um, they all get the job done. So in terms of a logistic um, perspective, those, those are sufficient. One thing that I've seen for, let's say, course delivery and then course, uh, I guess, yeah, course delivery live and then course delivery hosting. One key element that comes up a lot, a lot in terms of the logistics is what do you do for community? Because if you're doing a cohort-based course, one thing that's very powerful, David, is after this person comes in, they take the course, they take the first module, the second module, they want to ask questions, they want to participate, see what other people are doing. And I've seen people use Facebook as a, as a support mechanism, so where people can get support there. I've seen people use Slack, Circle. So all of these are, are fair game. Whichever technology you prefer, I like Slack a lot. Um, it creates a, a nice private environment. It's very interactive. There's a lot of chance for you to share multimedia resources in there. So that's another piece of the logistic pie to for you to think about when you're creating your course. The, that point that you made about privacy is, is something that I've heard recently in discussions about um, uh, courses or coaching, et cetera, uh, particularly when it's about sensitive topics, right, where maybe you don't want to be in a Facebook group and asking questions that are health related in a public forum, but where you can, you know, directly message the, uh, the instructor. Uh, and so the, I, I think that's an important consideration that, that, uh, that you, you raise there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's funny. I, okay, okay. I think um, one thing that I've seen is with a concussion uh, service provider, he teaches, he actually has a clinic, he has several clinics where he treats people on concussion protocol. And what he's done is he created a program where he teaches other doctors on how to evaluate people and then also how to treat them from a concussion protocol. And I imagine with that type of course as well, if you're asking specific questions like, oh, my patient is like this or like that, and his, I don't think they have to share their names, but um, it, it would create a safer space where the doctor themselves um, would feel safe asking questions and know that you know their, their, their friends or family or even potential clients aren't eavesdropping or checking in on the group and, and seeing what they're discussing. Yeah. All right. Now we got to sell these things. So let, let's talk briefly about that because we have just a few more minutes before we have to wrap up. 
And I imagine that there's also sort of things that are going to inform what channels you use, how you get people's attention, et cetera. Can you, can you sort of give us an overview of how you approach all of that? Yes. So that's a very important uh, piece of the puzzle. And we teach that in step number seven, where we call this the audience amplifier playbook. And the, the approach that we use is one where we um, identify different partners, where we can bring value to them. And we try to establish and build a relationship and we generate leads that way. So think of it like, you know, somebody that has an audience, like a, like a podcast, like a YouTube channel, we, uh, or a newsletter, or even a product. We, we will find these products or find these, these opportunities that make sense for our clients. We'll help them establish a relationship. We'll get our client in front of that audience. And then that audience will now be introduced by that audience, that, that community owner. Right? It's no longer an ad that's being shown to them cold. It's no longer this cold outreach. It's, it's somebody else introducing you to their audience. And so what happens there, what we've seen in the data is that when we've run ads or when we've even generated leads through organic or through, through SEO, for example, when somebody comes in through a partnership, they are much more likely to buy, like 15 to 25% more likely to buy than the other channels. And, it, and it's, it's so cool to see that we don't always get a lot of leads, but the leads that do come in, they're ready to buy, they're interested, they participate more, they ask questions, they'll read more of your content, they'll read more of your emails. It's, it's just such a great, great way. And, and so we're always looking for better ways and easier ways to find the partnerships, establish the partnerships and accelerate that for our clients. It, what you're speaking of is a concept, and there's lots of different names for it, whether it's it's borrowed authority or mm -hmm. leveraged relationship or you know some 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 other permutation of that um, where you are taking somebody else's audience and as as you said, taking you know advantage of a shortcut, which I think is brilliant because what what the point that I think um, was buried in there somewhere is, it doesn't cost the, uh, the the course creator the investment of figuring out how to get the traffic and attention and awareness themselves because they're leveraging somebody else's existing audience. And so, you know, I don't know what the relationships are that you develop. Maybe you're paying them a commission for the sales that they are, uh, you know, um, helping make. Maybe it's some other arrangement, but my, my assumption is and because I keep hearing you use the word data, I'm going to guess that you know the answer to this, um, is that overall it's actually a, a smarter or better investment going this route, not only for speed, but also for cost of acquisition. Yes. So when it comes to um, brokering a deal, it depends. It really depends on the partner. It really depends on you, the client, the person that's trying to, to get in front of a new audience. Sometimes there is an opportunity to pay and that's a great way because you could pay a fee, get in front of an audience and you, it, that's just a straightforward way. Um, the, the, the other route is simply to, to start a slow, real honest growth of a relationship. You might write a guest post for somebody because you genuinely like their audience and you genuinely like what they're doing and you know how to help their audience. And after that, you might lead into a webinar, which might lead to something else down the road. So uh, the data still shows us that it's it's not the most predictable. And that's something that I, I, I'm, that's like on my mind when I go to sleep is how can we make this more predictable and scalable so that client X within the next 30 days could have X number of partnerships, which should lead us you know, to exposure to 10,000, 50,000 people. That's something that I, I still need to nail down is how do I make this more predictable and scalable? But it, it, it still is a program that we've been able to implement for our clients and help them and coach them through it that has been super effective, su super effective. Okay, I, I want to circle back to, to something I heard you say when, when I asked you a question. You said, well, that's step seven. Step seven of what? It sounds like you have a, a full framework here. Um, can you explain what that is? Yeah, so we have a, a, a three-phase program called the Six Figure Launch uh, Course Launch Program, and it's divided up into three phases and nine steps. And so uh, the three phases, like we said, we figure out your product, we figure out your funnel, 
And then lastly, you figure out your audience. And who is that for? I'm assuming somebody who already has a course is, is really who this is for, or is it uh, for somebody who's wanting to develop a course or both? The ideal customer is somebody that already has a course, has already uh, created a course in the past, or they, they're at the very minimum, they have the outline, they have the idea for the course, and they're simply looking for somebody to, to help them tweak the, the offer. Um, and that really needs help on the next two parts, which is the funnel. Usually all of my clients, I should say most of my clients, don't have any type of a funnel or their funnel is just a mess or they just have no idea. Mm -hmm. And then the last part, they, they have no audience, right? So they're very, they struggle a lot with getting traffic, with getting leads, with, you know, getting in front of people. Those are usually the two parts that we help people with the most. So, uh, our, our promise is to get you to six figures within six months or less. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you have a course and you want to go faster, but you don't want to wait forever and trying to figure everything out, everything out and you don't want to deal with all the tech overwhelm, uh, check us out at nerddigital.com because we can help you. Awesome. Well, I was just about to ask where they can find out, but you you jumped the gun. So uh, nerddigital.com is, is the place to, to find more details about what you are offering for folks. Um, and, you, and you had something else that you had mentioned before we hit record in terms of um, uh, information or assets that, that you wanted to share as well. What was that? Yeah, so for, for your audience, David, they can go to nerddigital.com forward slash David, and they'll be able to pick up a course calculator. And so the course calculator, what that'll do is help you figure out how much you could earn with a course today. So you'll plug in your numbers, and it'll spit out you know, an estimate of what you could earn with the course. You simply plug in a few numbers like your audience size, how much traffic you get to your, your website, your some details about your email list, open rates, and things like that and you, you, the price of your course, and it'll give you some really good estimates. Plus, it'll help you figure out, okay, what am I missing in my existing stack right now? What in my existing strategy? What, what are the gaps? So there's, a, there's a, a resource, plus there's a video training that goes along with it. They can go to nerddigital.com forward slash David, and uh, they can pick that up today. That's awesome. And, and I assume they have to opt in to, to get access to that. Is that right? So the, right. what you've just talked about, again, teaching moment here, um, is a concept that w we refer to as engineering as marketing, uh, which is that that calculator is a is a tool that is very meaningful to somebody to be able to figure something out. And they're not going to necessarily be able to utilize, you know, just a, a spreadsheet or go and read a blog post and figure out how to do it. And you're giving them a shortcut to it. And that's how you begin the relationship. I, I think that's a, a brilliant approach. So uh, thanks for allowing me to use it as a, as a teachable moment as well. Oh, thank you for talking about it so nicely, David. <laughs> well, brilliant. I, I'm going to um, spend a bunch more time on your site, and I'll, I'll likely be opting in, although I don't have a new course um, ready to go, uh, just so I can see the, the calculator as well. So um, we'll leave the, the two resources, the main website and, um, and uh, the, the resource that you just mentioned, uh, links in the show notes. And in the meantime, um, Marcio Santos, thank you so very, very much for joining me here on uh, More Perfect Marketing. You're welcome, David, and I, I really thank you for, for having me on today. Indeed. Folks, this has been another episode of More Perfect Marketing. We hope to see you back here again real soon. Take care.